Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie recht herzlich zu dieser Veranstaltung. Mein Name ist Kathleen Bühler, Kuratorin der Ausstellung Grenzgänge. Das ist das Letzte, was ich jetzt in Deutsch sage. Ich möchte Sie nochmals daran erinnern, dass wir das Gespräch in Englisch führen und dass wir aber, wenn Sie Fragen haben und sich unsicher fühlen, da auch gerne für Sie übersetzen. Einfach, dass Sie das im Hinterkopf haben. Übersetzen brauchen Sie auch nicht, aber ich werde auf Englisch antworten. <laughs> so, uh, welcome, a very special welcome also to Serena Young and uh, Beat Hechler and Natalie Lurcher, because you are our partners in this wonderful exhibition and this talk, in this conversation with my distinguished guest, Kunde Koister whom I'm very happy to receive because you're something of a rarity. You're really the old, uh, uh, a specialist in a field that for, uh, for us here in Switzerland or for many people around the world is like a, a dark spot. It's like something that is hidden away. It's not easy to learn about. There's many rumors, there's many misconceptions and many suspicions and maybe also many fears. And I'm very happy, first of all, that I had um, possibility with the private collection of Uli and Rita Sik to learn more about these dark spots through the arts, artworks themselves. You will see a selection of the artworks that are also in the exhibition and, of course, some of the stills from the films that are on display at the Alpine Museum in Bern. Th that show will continue until next July so you will have more time to go back and back and again to see them. And uh, our show will uh, close on September 5th. So Kunde Koester, you are actually a historian. So how did, what did spark your interest in North Korean art? Well, I'm a historian of modern Korea. Mm -hmm. So that means Korea before it was divided. And Should I move closer to the mic? Maybe, or I give you mine. Was it switched off? Potentially it's off. Is it? Uh, no, but no. Then okay. Um, so as I said, I, uh, I'm, I'm a historian of uh, modern Korea, so before the division. Uh, and, and in the classes I teach, uh, I teach uh, everything from modern Korea up to the contemporary period. So in that sense, uh, North Korea inevitably is part of uh, what I look at. Secondly, um, I was a student, an exchange student in South Korea, the period 1986-1990, and that is the period of the democratization struggle in South Korea. And the democratization struggle in South Korea was a struggle for democracy, democratization in the South, but at the same time, activists were also calling for um, reunification with North Korea. And that has always been part of uh, the democracy struggle. Uh, we, I think we have forgotten that South Korea was also an authoritarian state until the late 80s, uh, and, and that The division is something that was that happened to Korea. It was not something the Koreans themselves wanted. And when uh, the two states, when in fact in, in the South, uh, the South Korean elected president decided to push forward the establishment of a government that de facto created the Republic of Korea, so South Korea. And as a response, North Korea established the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and that Um, galvanized the division, uh, but this was a political decision that mm -hmm. was not necessarily popular, that was not supported by the people. And then, of course, the Korean War eternalized this division. I mean, the Korean War, if you want to understand the Korean War, I always tell my students the Korean War was written in the stars because neither the South nor the North wanted the division. They wanted a unified Korea mm -hmm. under their control, of course, both North and South. So even before uh, the famous 25th of June 1950, when officially, or at least that's the historical date when the Korean War started, there had been a lot of skirmishes along the division line, the 38th parallel. Uh, but of course, it's 
convenient, and it is true, the North Koreans started this big assault on the 25th of June, but um, the war was in a way already ongoing and would erupt in any case because there was no way of solving it mm -hmm. politically. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm starting a course here that uh, was not the, the, the intention, of course, but it, it, it gives you an, uh, an insight in the background to where my interest uh, comes from. And um, specifically art, um, that's part of my intellectual development in the sense that in terms of history, I grew more and more interested uh, already from the period when I was in South Korea in historiography. Part of the democratization struggle was questioning the way uh, modern Korean history was written in South Korea during the authoritarian era. And the way to destabilize the authoritarian state was come up with a different historical narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and so my interest was uh, peaked into historiography rather than just history as collecting the facts and establish the uh, historical narrative, but also look at um, what is the context within this, uh, the political context, social context, within which different narratives develop. And that further de developed into looking at uh, politics of memory. In the 1990s, there was a, a kind of uh, late 1990s, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in uh, South Korea, looking at um, cases of state violence against citizens in South Korea. And then we're talking about the period prior to and during the Korean War. Um, and those were cases where millions of people have been killed. Um, that if they were talked about, it was blamed on the North Koreans. But in fact, after research, it turned out it was the South Korean state forces that uh, committed a lot of uh, um, these killings. And well, the time was ripe in the late 90s to really look at this. And when you, so this was something I was following. Um, and it was interesting to see that in the legislation that set up uh, these, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, part of it was uh, to think about the memorialization. I mean, the idea was if we acknowledge these civilian deaths, then they, these people deserve a place in our national historical narrative. And my question at that time was, so how does this translate into the historical landscape, in the memorial landscape? We have monuments um, that commemorate the soldiers who died. We have graveyards and so on. But the civilian deaths, there was nothing. They were completely forgotten. But the law said, we will also um, memorialize them. So I was interested in seeing how this would affect the memorial mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. And then of course, oops, mm -hmm. then of course we start moving into public art. Mm -hmm. now, now I come to North Korea. In 2004, I was approached by a gallery in the Netherlands um, because they had been shown a collection of North Korean artwork and they had no idea what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so they turned to me and they said, can you have a look and tell us whether it's interesting to do an exhibition? Mm -hmm. And I looked at it, and it was on the one hand a collection of oil paintings, and on the other hand, uh, posters. And it was a huge collection, and I got back to them and said, I can't really comment on the artistic value of this work. At that time, I really had no notion. But I can tell you that uh, something like this has never been shown uh, in this volume uh, in Western Europe. So from that perspective, you might be interested in hosting an exhibition. Artistic value is something that we have difficulties to acknowledge when we look at North Korean art. And it's also something that is maybe one of the cliches that probably you are maybe fed up to answer to mm -hmm. them. When people say, oh, but it's only propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's only uh, state, uh, the, the official voice of the state that we're seeing actually, what would you, answer people who say that also in regard to the artistic value yeah um, well, in fact that the, the, that question touches upon the trajectory that i have gone through ever since being confronted with that collection because they came back to me and said okay we decided to do the exhibition so please give us some background and i went into the library and i looked for work and there was nothing uh, and and but by chance i got to go uh, to north korea in 2004 
uh, and I started buying books in North Korea, catalogs and art theoretical works. Um, and well, so to, to answer your question, um, even the propaganda work is, if you like, it's in any case visual art. Mm -hmm. It visualizes a message and there is an aesthetic aspect to that. Mm -hmm. Whether that qualifies as art is a, a, a different discussion, and we have to discuss what is art. Um, but in North Korea, this kind of artwork is produced. It is described as artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and the aesthetic quality is part of the criteria to um, evaluate these artworks. I mean, there's loads of artists in North Korea some of them excel and they get commanded uh, and, and, and the reason why they get honors is because they produce artwork that is um, appreciated by the regime on the one hand but at the same time it will only be appreciated if it also has a kind of unique mm -hmm. value. Mm -hmm. North Korean art theory, it may surprise you, but North Korean art theory talks about um, developing the individuality of the artist because if the artist doesn't develop his or her personal touch then you could as well take photos because then what is the difference if it's just replicas of always the same now that does not mean that all art that is produced in North Korea is high quality the problem is that they don't really distinguish so there is a lot of very mediocre work being turned out, mm -hmm. but there are some really greatly talented artists who have a deep passion for what they do. But uh, tell me, I mean, North Korea, the collective, in North Korea, the collective is very important. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, one, uh, it's like something that must be very exotic if someone nourishes his or her individuality. And also many artworks are produced in a collective. So can you tell us a bit about the art system in North Korea mm. so that we understand maybe also the, the ramifications of what individuality means? Individuality and talent, they uh, are closely linked. Um, so the art system basically, uh, it starts of course with education, um, or maybe I should say it starts with scouting. Um, children are, as part of their schooling, they have an opportunity to draw, they get drawing lessons, um, they, can get to, they can go to after school institutes and get uh, further, if they are interested, further drawing lessons. Uh, and people are on the, on the lookout. So unlike what parents here would do when you say, when a child says, oh, I would like to become an artist and say, oh, no, no, don't do that because you have no future in North Korea. Becoming an artist is quite prestigious. I mean, really well-regarded artists are part of the national elite. So in that sense, it's a very comfortable life. You, you are part of the social elite as an artist. Um, so, on the one hand, these institutes are scouting for talent. Mm -hmm. And if the child indicates that they want to pursue and further develop, then they will put, put, be put on a track towards a, becoming a professional artist. Once that happens, the training develops from merely developing the technique to also ideological training. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, that is teaching them uh, what it means to be an artist. It's, that's where they are confronted with what art means in North Korea. And the notion of art in North Korea is very different from our modern notion of art, which is very much art as a domain, a realm unto itself, lar pur lar. In North Korea, art is subservient. Art um, is not its own master, it has a master. And that master is the leader, the party, the revolution, the people. And so art and artists have to serve society, the party, the leader. But this is always 
straightforward, you know. Like, for example, when I look at socialist, Soviet socialist realism, already in the 40s you see there are some double meanings and some subtext, and people are clever, are following the rules, are serving the system, but at the same time, and that's why I like uh, this idea that an image says more than a thousand words, they can subvert also the meaning. And since also individuality for us in the Western world is so much tied to freedom and liberty, how does that still mm -hmm. uh, work in a North Korean way of thinking? Over the years, I've been thinking about this a lot, of course, uh, and, and I have basically moved towards trying to get in touch and talk to North Korean artists to figure out what mm -hmm. the scope is within which they can operate. So I've, I've studied a lot of North Korean art theory, art pedagogy, uh, and there they talk about what an artist should be, but I wanted to see what it means in practice. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, how does this theory translate into real life? Mm -hmm. um, the way I understand it and the way I interpre interpret what uh, the artists tell me is, as so you go through this education process and you're trained into thinking about yourself as an artist, as somebody in the service of you, you, you have a duty to society, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they take that very seriously. And that is why they produce this kind of work. I mean, unlike what you may think, and unlike what maybe also some collectors think, that you have artists who, and what I also thought for a long time, you have artists who paint this kind of work, and then you have artists who paint landscapes, uh, still lives, portraits, anything but these highly ideological, what are called in North Korea, Jujehua theme paintings, thematic paintings. But that's not the case. They uh, paint both landscapes and these works. And unlike what you may think that these works are commissioned, they are not commissioned. They are the initiative of artists themselves. And that is already, I mean, if, if you're provocative, you could say it's the freedom of the artist mm -hmm. to decide on a subject and to figure out how this subject is then visualized. Mm -hmm. However, the realm within which subjects are picked is extremely narrow. Mm -hmm. Now, I just said it's their own free decision in the sense that um, they operate in a specific social and artistic context. You have the Federation of, North Korea, of Korean Artists, that basically governs the art community. Um, they decide on which works will be exhibited. And as an artist, you strive towards getting your work exhibited. Mm -hmm. Because if you get exhibited, you can get recognition. In all works that are exhibited get a grade. Mm -hmm. The grade translates in money, mm -hmm. um, good apartments, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, so that's one incentive. Secondly, there is the incentive of being a good artist. So you do want to contribute. It does not mean that all work is their own decision. Work is commissioned. They work in an art studio, and so you could consider them as workers, employees of the art studio. So it may well be that a building needs an artwork. A public building, a theater, in the hall of the theater there will be a huge painting. Well. The director of the theater calls up the Mansude Art Studio and says, I need a painting. And then, of course, there is a commission. But even then, mm -hmm. the artists get together and start to think, what shall we paint? It's not their sole decision. Mm -hmm. Of course, they go back. But let's be frank. Artists who work with galleries here, you know how that works? The gallerist will say, ah, do a bit more of that. It goes well. But of course, when we talk about North Korea, and we talk about, mm -hmm. my impression is when we talk about North Korea, uh, we present it as, and we think of it as totally different. That we do not want to make the connection. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, by 
what I would like to call othering North Korea and othering the North Korean art world at the same time, we pretend a pristine reality for the art world we have. I mean, talk to any artist and they will say, I'm a free individual. Nobody tells me what I should do. But then push a little or scratch a little bit and you will find that it's not so clear cut. You could say ideologically, they are convinced that they are free, but the social context within which they operate, a social context in which they need public recognition, means that they have to find ways to get into gallery, uh, in, into museum collections, get to be noted and spotted by curators. And so there is a field within which an artist operates, which, if you like, a sociologist would say that is a limit on mm -hmm. this kind of believed absolute freedom. Mm -hmm. But are you, were, you are also one of the rare person, I'm, I'm aware, uh, who did field work really within the art scene in North Korea. Were you aware of any way of critical discussions among them? Because this is how in our narrative or our art history is how we push forward. No, in modern art. art. Or in modern art and postmodern art. And postmodern art. Yes. Uh, and I think that is part of the, um, you, you could say once art becomes lar pur lar, and the question is, how do you distinguish yourself? It's by distinguishing yourself from, the, from others, so by being different. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. Mm -hmm. um, but if you I, like to, I like to make mm -hmm. the comparison with the Bruegels or Rubenses or Rembrandts of uh, mm -hmm. our art history and what makes them excel. It's mm -hmm. not that they break boundaries, it's that within the boundaries they excel. Mm -hmm. And by excelling within the boundaries, they push boundaries. And so it's by using the, the, the power of visual arts to bring it forward. Yes. So in the case of North Korea, for example, um, you could say that uh, by the 1960s, the diversity that existed in North Korean art production was completely abolished and there was only one single style, if you like, that remained. Everything had been reduced to socialist realism. Mm -hmm. Socialist realism, uh, it's, 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 it's an, in a way also an empty term. Mm -hmm. But what you see is, you could also read this as a starting point because mm -hmm. one of the questions I asked myself, so you have, I met in 2005, Ri Chang. I, maybe I should mention a bit more names yeah. because for yes. me, they're not anonymous. Yes. I know a number of yes. people and I've had really interesting conversations with them. And I should add, I do these conversations in Korean, and it's important, so I don't mm -hmm. depend on a translator. Um, even the North Korean guides, they're not translators, they're, so their translations are approximative. They're not well versed in art, so that is not something, so that is one limit to the way they translate. And also they're not trained as interpreters, so it's not a one-on-one -on -one translation, it's basically a summary of what has been said that they usually give you. So I don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. I don't have an intermediary. I speak directly. That, of course, also has an effect on the person you talk to. Mm -hmm. Because when I speak, as I speak here, it's more than just words. It's, it's emotion. It's energy. That, too, gets communicated. Mm -hmm. So the response is more direct and more, if you like, individual, particularly if you meet someone more than once mm -hmm. and over a longer period of time. So Ri Chang. How did I get to Ri Chang? Uh, oh yes, Ri Chang. Ri Chang, an old man, and he's still active now. Uh, but even so, we're speaking more than 15 years later. But even then, he was—he already had a career of uh, close to 40 years. Mm -hmm. A career of 40 years. It's not possible that somebody keeps doing it with passion. Where I mean, it's just not imaginable. Why would a painter who is way beyond his uh, retirement age still go to the studio and paint if it's not a passion he mm -hmm. has? Mm -hmm. So what is that passion? And the way I understand it is, it is trying to refine your own touch. I mean, these are chosen lab painters, so uh, ink and brush, uh, ink and water, what is it? Uh, uh, watercolor. Uh, w watercolor, so ink painting traditional style, 
ink painting. What is it that keeps pushing him to keep on painting? And it's basically perfecting his technique, his style. But then when you say in the West we have this art pour art attitude, I mean, perfecting a style or a virtuosity, you, you never had the feeling that sometimes it's also a means in itself, perfecting the technique. I mean, I'm very impressed, especially... Oh, Che Chang is a brilliant guy. Yeah, by this sheer virtuosity. And mm. I think also I had the feeling in the, here in the Western world we got rid of this, but there's something that's also missing somehow that we mm. haven't we haven't yet found a place for virtuosity. Mm. Uh, so. But virtuosity is not enough. So mm -hmm. one of the artists I work with, can I talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the project I did? Mm -hmm. um, so I ultimately got to do field work um, and I had, in the preparation of it, I had told the North Koreans, these are the people I want to work with uh, based on earlier encounters I had and on the basis of catalogues and the works that were interesting. And so of the long list of names, I got uh, to meet a number of them and then basically said, this is the person I want to work with because of the good contact I had. I mean, I remember in the Pyongyang University of Fine Arts, first visit there, there's a room full of uh, lecturers and there is one guy there who has such an open face and is really following attentively what I'm saying I was not alone, I was with, with Alice Wielinga, a photographer, who is doing also her project along the same lines, what does it mean to be an artist in North Korea? Um, and he was so into our discussion, I said, this guy, I want him on the project. Turns out he is a lecturer of Chosun Huan, then in particular uh, figure painting. As I go to the museum at the university, I find out he's uh, one of the people who paints leader portraits. So he's among the highest he's in the hierarchy. High, he's rather young, so he's not the highest. Mm -hmm. He's a distinguished painter, but not a people's artist. Um, but the, the kind of disconnect between this very open, mm -hmm. interested mm -hmm. person and then the fact that he paints this kind of painting, you think, ah, but not this one, but uh, leader paintings, you think, wow, this is interesting. Because mm -hmm. now I get to ask, why you paint them? What does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. And the answer is double. On the one hand, you get the answer you expect, the answer I know from reading the art theory, but then I hear it in his voice, with his mimicry, with his uh, tone of voice with the energy he has. Now I met among the people I selected there is uh, uh, Pak Wang Rim, the person I just talked about, and there is Oun Byol. Oun Byol is a, is a woman uh, was a child prodigy and uh, I didn't know she did uh, leader painters either but uh, when I visited her studio it was in the section dedicated to leader paintings. Okay. But th that's of, another thing what interested me, the gender aspect. Are there women painters? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Among the group of uh, artists I worked with uh, at Mansude Art Studio, two were women of the three artists I worked with there. And then at uh, the Pyongyang University of Fine Arts, you won't be surprised that we're all men. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, among the artists, yeah, there are also women, and and there is, but you could say there is a gender difference in the, the kind of uh, artwork they make. Partly because you have these men mm -hmm. teaching at the academy uh, or at the fine arts museum, and they tell them, oh, these are good subjects for 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 women for girls. Uh, but um, yeah, 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 there's some for formidable uh, mm -hmm. female artists, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so Owen Biol. Um, Again, a very interesting case. In both their cases, what struck me uh, is a kind of softness, a kind of total dedication. There is difference in the case of uh, Pak Wang Rim. It comes with the benefits. He comes from the province. 
Uh, and so he has had uh, an upward social mobility. Mm -hmm. He comes, I mean, when we did one of the interviews with him, he came in these extremely fancy leather shoes and okay. really dressed up and kind of a dandy. But doesn't sound like a regular North Korean guy, or is this my cliche I have? That no, 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 a regular North Korean guy doesn't dress up. And Che chang -ho, for example, is total opposite. Yeah. He is a very rough guy. He doesn't care. I mean, he puts on the, the uniform that Mang Day offers to their painters. Uh, he wouldn't uh, think about uh, dressing up for, for an interview. No, no, no. He's not that kind of person. He's a rough-hewn guy. Uh, but uh, Pak Van Rim, very, very different. Almost effeminate. Mm -hmm. um, but a very warm person also. And Owen Biol has a kind of naivety over a kind of blind belief in the goodness of the leader. So when I asked her, what is it that you want to portray? What, what, what um, for you, um, encapsulates a leader painting? What are the leader painter paintings that you make? And she said, without much hesitation, love. It's the love of the leader for the people. Because the paintings we see here in the Ulysses collection, it's interesting, they're very martial. Um, but that's only one aspect. And, and you could push and, and go this one, for example. It's an interesting one. It's 1994. And you go to the history, and you look, 1994. It's a very bizarre year. It's a year that Kim Il-sung dies. This is painted before the death of Kim Il-sung. Before the death of Kim Il-sung, we have uh, an, a completely out of control nuclear crisis where the Americans are ramping up the pressure and um, uh, putting pr ramping up the pressure and saying we will annihilate you. Mm -hmm. I mean we were in 1994 on the brink of an attack on North Korea until Jimmy Carter unbeknownst to uh, Bill Clinton or not with the total consent of uh, the White House, traveled to Pyongyang and got a kind of agreement. And so, not unlike what we saw in 2018, the tone descended again. But it's a it was a crisis that went on for two years, ramping up pressure. Of course, as you probably are all aware, North Korea responds to pressure with um, provocations. So they were... Uh, responding with showing, we will not bow down, we will respond. And so, mm -hmm. that the painting you saw with uh, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il with these rockets, these missiles being launched, it's uh, missile tests, target practicing if you like, mm -hmm. but it's a message to the outside world. But it's also a message to North Koreans, because North Koreans are aware of, this is commented on in the North Korean media, and so artists, uh, if you like, translate this into uh, this particular painting, translate this in, in, their, in, in their artwork. And this is interesting because it's, it's, it's a sky in flames. So it really gives you, despite the smiling faces of the leaders, it's, 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 it's a very ominous, very heavy uh, painting. But it's really typical. It, mm -hmm. it captures well the, the atmosphere of, let's say, spring 1994. Mm -hmm. But somehow I'm, I'm always um, surprised because when I think about these paintings, it reminds me also when you uh, explain the context where they were made. Uh, for example, in the 1930s, as a way of uh, spiritual resistance against uh, the danger of, um, of the Second World War, we also had the call in Switzerland to boost the motivation and national identity to choose subjects for our art that are very national, patriotic, and uh, uplifting. Is it difficult to compare this to that? What would you say as a historian? It is comparable in the sense that the social context, everybody, an artist too, lives in a social environment and they are uh, responding to that mm -hmm. social environment in one way or another, mm -hmm. if I make may make a quick side jump in the exhibition here, the Tansekwa paintings, mm -hmm. the abstract mm -hmm. paintings, in a way they are also a response to the authoritarian regime and the very limited scope 
of what was possible in terms of figurative art. Mm -hmm. And so it's a return, a retreat, if you like, from painting uh, reality mm -hmm. uh, and how they would, I mean, and, and engaging directly with, with reality and, and giving a social commentary mm -hmm. as artists are wont to do also in, mm -hmm. in, in our societies. Oh, they had to retreat, if you like. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's a, it's, it's a social contest. It, it does not mean that they were forced to, mm -hmm. but it was eventually the path they chose. Um, in the case of North Korea, of course, the, the pressure is, or the context is much more restrictive. Mm -hmm. So to give an example, the day starts with I mean, every, every North Korean uh, reads the Rodong Shinmun or has the Rodong Shinmun read to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the, art, the, the party newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, not the most exciting newspaper, but for okay. artists it's important because you get to follow uh, the discourse of the day. Yeah. And for them it's important because that's the echo chamber within which they operate. And so Having gone to North Korea now a number of times and having visited, for example, the national exhibition, yearly event, um, you see that uh, the art production responds to events on the calendar throughout the year. And this can be uh, contemporary social political events. Mm -hmm. This can be historical anniversaries. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it means that, and, and so, yeah, that, that, that is where they find their subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the way they develop it is up to them. So, like Owen Biol and her leadership paintings, she told me she was asked by uh, Mansude to paint one of, uh, of the paintings for the refurbished uh, Korean War Museum in Pyongyang. The, it's not called Korean War Museum, it's called the uh, uh, Great Fatherland Liberation War Museum. Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked her about the painting, uh, and she said, well, and, and how, how it works. And she said, well, what you then do is um, you go to the library and you start studying. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the history and you try to find an episode, mm -hmm. an episode that captures what it is you want to show, an episode that can be visualized and that is one moment, but one moment that tells a story. You mentioned earlier, an image can tell more than 10,000 words, but well, that's the thing. You, as an artist, when you paint this kind of thematic paintings, you try to find, uh, you try to find a subject that can be visualized in such a way that the painting tells you a story. Mm -hmm. And that's what fascinates me in North Korean art. Mm -hmm. so to, go back to, to go back to your earliest question, earlier question, uh, why North Korean art interests me. Um, a lot of these thematic paintings deal with historical subjects. And so the North Korean artwork tells history to North Korean viewers. So what are the episodes they pick? What are the moments they pick? And what is, if you put them all together, what kind of historical patchwork is created? Uh, what kind of historical memory is created in producing that kind of artwork? So if we had access to a North Korean art history, we can't, could follow this inner reflection and uh, meditation on their own history. Or is this one uh, aim of your project that you're following? Um, I'm not an art historian and I've tried to find, uh, I know it exists, but I haven't, had, I haven't been able to lay a hand on it, on uh, the contemporary art history. So I have an art history that leads up to uh, the foundation of North Korea, but not what follows. Mm -hmm. um, in catalogs, it's very, through catalogs, it's very difficult to um, figure out. Uh, I have a very good South Korean colleague who has done some work and she's a trained art historian. She has a pretty good grasp and her work is really interesting to, to read, Kerry Park, Park Kerry. Um, but other than that, it's, it's so basically what you have to do is uh, piece it together through interviews with, uh, and conversations with, with artists and figure out like Che Chang-ho, for example, he is um, 
Li Chang is the first generation, if you like. Che Chang Ho is the next generation. Then Owen Biol is the, another mm -hmm. successor mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you talk to them, you hear, like, uh, Kim Gyu Won is another uh, artist I met. He, uh, he, he became an artist uh, basically by, at first, his mother brought him to Mansude and asked at Mansude, is there someone here who can uh, help my son uh, develop his talent. And so one of the artists, one of the great artists, Jong um, uh, Chang Mo, uh, took him under his wing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a little kid, he would sit with uh, with Jong Chang Mo and uh, he told me, Kim Gyu Won told me, you know, initially he said, uh, when I went to the studio, and he's one of the people where uh, foreign visitors would often come to the studio and say, well, if foreigners come, you just say that you're my son. <laughs> This reminds me very much of, for example, also the, the history of Caravaggio, how he became a painter. So, and if I hear this, it often reminds me of former uh, art historical uh, periods. What does make this art contemporary? If, if we... The date of production. The date of production, okay. And the fact that it speaks to contemporary North Korean subjects. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look at it from, uh, a, a, let's say, a global art historical perspective, which I would say traditionally is a Western European um, uh, perspective, in the sense that the way we write art history is very much based on mm -hmm. a trajectory of progression, war, uh, yeah. a progression of European art, continental art. Um, then it's, it's an outlier, of course. It, it doesn't speak to it. With, with basically, it's, you could say it's a, it's, it's a branch of, a branch development of, uh, of, of this Western art mm -hmm. tradition. Mm -hmm. And it has two uh, different roots. So the link with Western art is, and, and North Korean artists, when they go through training, they study aesthetics, it's uh, European aesthetics that they study. Uh, but it goes by the, uh, the, the exit socialist realism. Mm -hmm. So you go from uh, the Peret, Peret I keep forgetting the word, I mean the, the, the realist school in, uh, in, in, in Russian art towards the establishment of socialist realism. And that's the end point. And that's where North Korea tags in. Mm -hmm. So for them, Western art is the entire development of our painting tradition up to socialist and ending reaching socialist mm -hmm. realism. So that's one aspect. And then of course there is the return to <coughs> its own art tradition. Mm -hmm. Interpreted. Like ink, ink painting. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, ink painting, so North Korean art quintessentially, or the reference point of North Korean art is Chosun Hwa. And Chosun Hwa, why? Because Chosun Hwa builds on local traditions. Uh, now, this is, there's an ideological reason for that. North Korean's ideology, Chuche, uh, is often, as far, in my, from my perspective, mistranslated as self-reliance. Um, it's better translated as autonomy, absolute autonomy, which means North Koreans do not answer to anyone. North Korea finds its source in itself and in its own traditions. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, of course, um, it's a fiction, it's a myth, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it explains partly also why Cho Son Hwa had to become the reference point of North Korea's art development. And Cho Son Hwa is a development of traditional uh, ink and brush painting. So it's uh, ink on paper. Uh, well, well, we, in, you also say a, uh, Asian painting or Chinese painting? Mm -hmm. Asian. Mm -hmm. um, now, this was initially, um, in the early years, the 50s, was looked down upon because it was literati-style painting. It, were, it was the elite 
in pre-revolutionary days that painted that kind of style. Mm -hmm. So North Korea revamped it by bringing in color. And what is really typical of mm -hmm. Cho Hwa is the very vibrant colors. And these vibrant colors they got from folk painting, mm -hmm. Minwa, mm -hmm. which has a lot of very primary colors on the one hand. And then there is, uh, you could say literati painting is amateur art. Mm -hmm. But then you had also professional art in the pre-revolutionary period. Professional art was court painters mm -hmm. who were in fact documentalists. And it's a combination of this mm -hmm. uh, popular, popular style painting mm -hmm. and the use of color mm -hmm. and the techniques, partly from literati style, but also this very fine uh, professional art style of painting. Mm -hmm. And so they brought it all together and developed something mm -hmm which they call you, at the same time, despite uh, what they themselves say, in, which is something B.G. Moon repeats. Mm -hmm. It's one of the authors in our catalog. Uh, of course, there is a very clear link to uh, the development of socialist realism in a, ch in, in a traditional style, as they did it in, uh, in, in China. And there is one painting that I asked to have in, uh, in this slideshow that is... I think it's the next. Now we have, yeah, this painting, it's a Chinese painting, but so this is Joe and Lai visiting a family in the Chinese uh, autonomous, uh, sorry, the Korean autonomous zone in the northeast of China. Uh, and so you have Joe and Lai there and you have a, a painting of uh, Mao in the background. It's a painting from the 70s. Now cut out Joe and Lai, put in Kim Il-sung, put a photo of Kim Il-sung and you have a North Korean painting. But just to say how, um, how related they are. It doesn't mean they are copycats. There is a development in North Korea, mm -hmm. but it's not something that happened out of the blue. There has always been cultural contact between China mm -hmm. uh, and North Korea, between China and the Soviet Union. So there is this influence mm -hmm. uh, that publicly they will not acknowledge. But when you talk to the artists, they, they will not shy away from, uh, mm -hmm. from, from admitting this. Mm -hmm. When I was talking to Uli Sik, and I welcome him warmly in our midst, he said that a specialty for him was that this socialist realism version in North Korea was very emotional compared to the Chinese socialist realism or Soviet. Could you elaborate a bit on that? Because the urgency to express the love uh, in the system must be similar in all these three um, systems. I'm an expert on Korea and not on the Soviet Union nor the People's mm -hmm. Republic of China, so I hesitate to really mm -hmm. comment much on it. Um, I'm going to say something that I will regret okay. uh, because it's a dangerous thing to talk in essentialist terms. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I would say that if we can talk about some, if we can talk about national character. And that's a dangerous thing. Uh, that's a very dangerous thing, so I would like to put it between brackets. Still, you will agree with me that a Swiss is different from a German and an Austrian, right? Uh, and then to try to figure out what is the difference, that's tricky. And it's not something that is clear cut, but there are blobs, and, and, but you cannot draw an exact line, mm -hmm. but there is something there. Mm -hmm. Typical for Koreans is that they are quite um, emotional and very expressive in their emotion. Now that may be mm -hmm. a partial explanation. Mm -hmm. The second thing, uh, after having read this beautiful catalog, I really recommend it. It's 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 a, a brilliant work. B.G. Moon talks about the melodrama of these paintings. Um, in fact, referring to this excessive emotion. I'm, I was thinking afterwards, maybe rather than an excessive emotion, it's the purity of the emotion. Mm -hmm. And so think again of what I mentioned earlier. Minhua is about primary colors. These paintings, they're in your face with just one emotion. 
the emotion can differ from painting to painting, mm -hmm. but it's the purity of the emotion mm -hmm. that is what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is where it differs mm -hmm. from Chinese and Soviet mm -hmm. paintings. Mm -hmm. But this emotionality is certainly something they pay a lot of attention mm -hmm. to. And then, of course, I mean, when you look at this kind of painting, how can it not be emotional? It's the funeral of Kim Il-sung. I mean, it's, we've discussed this earlier today. I think the, the painting of the funeral where you see Kim Jong-il, the one on the landing, uh, please later on go and take a look. It's a fascinating work, partly because uh, this work was, I mean, this is not a commissioned work. From my understanding, it doesn't need to be a commissioned work. Now, I don't know, I haven't spoken to. I was surprised, I thought it would be Kim Song Min, who would have been, Uli Sig maybe could comment on this. Um, it says on the plaque Ri Song Ho or something. Mm -hmm. Are you sure it is of the, the, the name of the painter? Because it doesn't say on the painting itself. Uh, I personally am we get you a microphone just in a minute. Please. Uh, personally, I'm not in a position to say who the author is, other than what I can know. Yes. So Do you know where it was, in what studio it was painted? Was it Peko or Mansude? Well, Peko. That's... But uh, some of the people who painted the first version did also paint... Okay, but it's not... But, okay. Because the original was under the direction of Kim Song-min. That I know. Uh, so it's one of the team that then made the, the, the copy. That makes sense. Um, so we have to go back to Kim Song-min, the original work. And Kim Song-min was, uh, I think even at the time already, the head of the Mansude Art Studio. I already mentioned artists are part of the national elite. He is somebody who has direct access to the leader. Mm -hmm. Which uh, is, what, what is direct access to the leader? He, he talks regularly to Kim Jong-un or he meets him? Well, not Kim Jong-un, so in, in that ah, time we're talking about Kim ah, Il-sung. Il probably also Kim Jong-il, because Kim Jong-il had an interest in, in, in culture and art. Mm -hmm. um, art is politics in North Korea. So that is one reason why the top of Mansude has direct access. Mm -hmm. Direct access means that he can be called by Kim Il-sung. It doesn't mean that he goes to have coffee chat. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Mm -hmm. But Kim Il-sung may, may call him mm -hmm. for him to justify himself or to explain what it is he wants and then it trickles down. Mm -hmm. In that sense, direct access. Mm -hmm. um, but it means he has known Kim Il-sung. Second thing. There are interesting interferences. I hope it's not the North Korean <laughs> <laughs> secret service. <laughs> no. We're not saying anything wrong. No. Um, second important thing to remember is when Kim Il-sung died, it's basically the founder of the DPRK who died, who had been ruling since 1948. Um, he was omnipresent in North Korea. Nothing happened without the touch and the presence of the great leader. And this is what the media also told North Koreans. Um, so Kim Il-sung dies, and then what? You're lost. That's, that's a huge loss. And so you have a popular outbreak of mourning that for us was very strange, but for a Korean it's less strange. Funerals are very noisy events in Korea. Um, not necessarily in public, but in family. Here we see it in public. Is there a part staged? Of course. You have to show that you're a loyal citizen to all your mm -hmm. friends and neighbors. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is part stage, but there is also real raw emotion there. It's not only staged. It would be very reductive to reduce it to that. 
Kim Song Min, affected by the death of Kim Il Sung, affected by the death of this person he had contact with and he certainly looked up to as the leader, and seeing the emotion of the people, sees in this a moment that should be eternalized. It should be caught in painting. And so he sets to work with a number of people to paint in, I think, five humongous paintings, this scene of public sorrow. Now, the painting that is one uh, episode, if you like, of that painting is hanging upstairs here, where you see Kim Jong-il. And what is interesting is that the face of Kim Jong-il captures all the sorrow of the North Korean people. It's the face of, if you like, a son mourning the loss of his father. It's an unusually emotional face of a leader. Usually the leaders are smiling brightly. Mm -hmm. There's no worry in sight. They're a bright sun. Mm -hmm. It's a word they use. Mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un is the son of the 21st century. Um, Kim Il-sung is the son of humanity. Um, but here we have this contorted face of sorrow and mourning. Mm -hmm. And all people, and when you look at the painting, in fact, people are not individuals. They're, or they're not there as individuals. They're all representative of, social, mm -hmm. of a certain social group. So you have, on the right, you have the military mm -hmm. with uh, the flag of the military command. And you have uh, party members, you have students, you have so all different kinds of if you like, um, professions, mm -hmm. uh, organizations, mm -hmm. um, the way public life is structured. That is what, is what you're seeing in that painting. They're all looking up at uh, Kim Jong-il. And looking at Kim Jong-il and seeing their emotion in his face on the one hand, but also looking with expectation at him, the successor. There's also this kind of longing in the eyes of the people who are looking up to him. That painting is so much more than a propaganda. I mean, when we say propaganda painting, I think we stop to look at the painting. Mm -hmm. And we basically are looking at something and say, oh, this is propaganda. We're already turning away without having tried to engage with the painting. Mm -hmm. And I think in what I just described, I might have helped you to bridge that gap a little bit. It doesn't mean that you will like the painting. There's no need for you to like the painting. But at least to understand a little bit better what this work tries to achieve. Because let's go back to the start. Art is not for art's sake. Art has a purpose. What is this purpose? And how does it become effective? Well, take another look at that painting and ask yourself, for North Korea to look at this painting, it evokes the memories of those days. And so it becomes an image. The way we have images of, well, a nice example is 9-11, the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. We all know these images. And for us, 9-11 is the Twin Towers. Mm -hmm. It's one iconic image. But then, I mean, maybe this is one of the main differences in a Western notion of contemporary art. It's always also about raising awareness. This can be in, in, a, in an emotional field, but also in an intellectual. And actually what you were describing is more of commemorating or maybe even giving into nostalgic, nostalgia. And uh, I mean, Again, uh, you could say that's maybe what makes it for us so difficult. We are trained to see or to expect from art, from an art experience, that it touches us also aesthetically. It takes us with it. Maybe it comments on how it's done. But then I think if you're an expert in North Korean art, you also see the small comments where all these 
great artists somehow push the limits forward within their um, idea of art? For professional artists, I can't comment on what, what circulates mm -hmm. under the counter, if you like. Mm -hmm. I can only comment on what is shown in exhibition, what's en what ends up in uh, catalogs. And there, there is very little deviation. If I may give an example. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mentioned this uh, collection in, uh, that I was shown in 2004. Afterwards, I got to understand that these were paintings that were made in, uh, mainly in uh, local provincial art studios based on original artwork. So there were, in a way, copies, but not really copies, because I traced, traced I found the original of one of the paintings. The size was different. The name of the painter was also different. So it's, it's not really a copy. It's a you could say, a work inspired by uh, original artwork. And it's a scene of a, tr uh, a railway track where you have uh, a, a good North Korean um, railway worker who is uh, mending or taking care of uh, a certain part of the tracks. And in the original painting, there is um, a kind of milestone that is out of out of angle, it's it's mm -hmm. twisted a little bit. So in the mm -hmm. version that was shown in the exhibition, mm -hmm. it was properly put right. It was upright again. Mm -hmm. so that's so. Uh, no, 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 no. You don't show the poor side of North Korea. You show North mm -hmm. Korea. It should inspire pride. Mm -hmm. It should inspire. Although what is interesting, for example, now under Kim Jong Un, we see a slight difference. Um, already I've seen paintings also from the 90s where historical paintings, for example, they're all about heroism. Mm -hmm. You paint heroes, so you see these soldiers who dash forward. I mean, when you see paintings of the Korean War, for example, you wonder the North Koreans must have won because they're always advancing. And they're advancing, and they're advancing, and they must have long left the Korean Peninsula because they're still advancing. But they were pushed back over the 38th parallel. Now that pushback you will never see. No, no, no. North Korea won the Korean War, of course. Um, and so the paintings you see is they're, they're heroic. Soldiers may be wounded, but in the 1990s I saw a very interesting painting, this period of the famine. And uh, a scene of not the Korean War, but the partisan struggle on uh, the slopes of uh, Mount Pektu. Um, and you see a group of soldiers after uh, a clash, some wounded, but you also see in the background dead soldiers and their colleagues, their friends, crying over the dead. And I thought, this is North Korean artists speaking to what is taking place in North Korea. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, um, in North Korea, they talk today about uh, the, the famine of the mid-1990s as the arduous march. Mm -hmm. well, the arduous march is a historical reference to the 1930s, when Kim Il-sung also had an arduous march with his partisan fighters. So there is this historical link that links this, the scene I just described to oh. the famine. And so to see, but it's not in the center, it's not the prominent part, but mm -hmm. it's in the background. Mm -hmm. now, Bring it back to the Kim Jong-un era. Last year, during the national exhibition, uh, were a lot of paintings showing um, the recovery work after the devastation of the floods that had occurred in 2019. And it's interesting because before, under Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, nobody would ever mention flooding. I mean, until the hunger uh, the famine in North Korea. It took a long time for North Korea to admit there was famine and to call in mm -hmm. international help. Mm -hmm. It's something they could not admit because it's failure. Under Kim Jong-un, this has changed. If there is disaster, he will own up to it. And he will say, and, and so the shift is, attention is paid to the recovery work and to the heroics of the recovery. So you see scenes of devastated villages, but of course the main theme is the party members who travel to the devastated uh, areas to rebuild the villages. Mm -hmm. 
But the devastation you would normally not see in a painting. Because that's, in a way, that's not Korea failing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Under Kim Jong-un, there is an admission of the fact that not everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not his wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. It's these lousy party members who are not doing what they should do. But still, anyway, I'm... Mm -hmm. No, um, so um, what would you say? You very much understand also how it, within this system it works and it progresses still, uh, there is progression. What would you say is for us to gain if we look at North Korean art? Because there are these many um, cliches. What is for you? What do we gain? What is there for us to learn if we look and deal more with North Korean art? Or maybe it was my question already revealing. What do we learn? Well, when it comes to analyzing, I, I would say from my own engagement with North Korean art and North Korean artists, there are two aspects. When, with the art and reading the art the way I've done here a little bit, it gives us an insight in how North Korea, the North Korean regime, through its art production, succeeds in tying the people to itself. And it may help us understand the longevity of North Korea, because the narrative they produce is very coherent. Mm -hmm. And as long as North Koreans are in, if you like, in their bubble, it makes perfect sense. And it's very difficult to deviate from it. Mm -hmm. um, it it's so coherent. Mm -hmm. And art has a part in that. And reading art, analyzing their artwork, helps you in understanding how it works. Not only rationally. We can do that through analyzing the Rodong Shinmun, the party newspaper, and, and whatever theoretical writings they produce. But it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And that is the role of art also, to go one step further than education. I mean, they talk about this. Education and media, that's to rationally convince you. Mm -hmm. And then there is art and culture, and that is to emotionally convince you, to emotionally um, uh, take you in. Mm -hmm. And so to analyze it is to understand how the regime succeeds in conquering the hearts of the people in producing a narrative that is both coherent um, and convincing, mm -hmm. emotionally convincing. Mm -hmm. I think that is relevant. Mm -hmm. um, second thing, um, working with the artists, it allows us, and that's what you see in the Alpinist Museum also, um, it allows you to see real people with real emotions and it makes you realize that our way of, the way we are conditioned to look at North Korea is so incredibly narrow and so singularly focused on the regime and on the ideology that we fail to see that there are real people living there. Um, real people who have not chosen to live there, but live there nevertheless. I, mean, I like to refer to Heidegger mm -hmm. and his concept of geworfenheit, mm -hmm. the fact that you end up where you're born. You don't choose to be born where you're born. And you're socialized in that society. You grow up in a family, and you learn to function in society. It happens in Switzerland. It happens in North Korea. And people there, just as here, try to make the best of their life. Mm -hmm. They fall in love, create families, get kids, see their kids off to marriage, and so on and so forth. So meeting the artists, it's more than that, of course. It's try to understand. What does it mean to this artist to create this, this kind of work? But be 
also realize, in, and that is, maybe we can now ask the question to Ulisic again. Of course, we're looking here at work from a private collection where the collectioner decided to purchase or to seek to purchase specific artworks. To put it very bluntly, and that's, that's not a reproach because it's a, it's, it's a very sovereign decision of the collector, but it is not representative of the totality of North Korean art production. Uh, it's, North Korean art is much more diverse than just these team paintings. They're an important uh, part, but they're certainly not the majority of the work. They're, let's say, politically the most important. So like when you go to an exhibition or when you look at the catalog, these are the works that take pride of place. But there are a lot of landscape paintings. Uh, there are a lot of still lives. There is a wide diversity of, of subjects, partly also of styles. Um, and of course, this is not, but it's not the aim of the collection either to show this. But it might be interesting maybe to, if, if Mm -hmm. Can we ask the question? Absolutely. Would you be willing to explain your choice of words? And since we have a problem with the third microphone, maybe we can ask Ulisik to come forward and use my microphone instead. Could you? Yeah, we have this interference here in front. Maybe. <laughs> uh, your question is why I made the choices I made. Yes. <laughs> Do you have another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be brief. Well, I will When I happen to go to North Korea often, I each time went to uh, the two museums in Pyongyang, and uh, so I could get a good grasp of them total art production, as we can see it in public. And for me, it was clear that if I collect from that important period of North Korean history and art production, I must have like keywords. Keywords, of course, are political. Also, knowing well Russian and Chinese socialist realism, I wanted to collect something that may be unique in that type of style. And then, of course, it must include the leaders. And that was a big problem because they, that mm. is not on the market. No one can buy that other than if it's uh, permitted, approved by the top, top layer of government. So I had to negotiate with them and it took years. And at first, they said, okay, we understand, uh, because you are you, we will uh, allow you to collect one painting. <laughs> so if I want to collect one painting with the leaders, uh, I told them, um, I don't want just any painting. I want a painting with your rocket arsenal. I didn't mention nuclear arsenal at the time. They never fired them, of course, so it has to be <laughs> missiles and not uh, yeah. nuclear weapons. So that's what they suggested. But they suggested other works at the same time. So I told them, the works are so good, I cannot decide. <laughs> I want all of them. So they said, well, you know, we only have the permission for one. So I said, here is a phone called Pyongyang. So they called Pyongyang, it took about two hours, and they came back and they said, well, the government said, because it's Mr. Sick, yes, he can have several. So that's why I have several, but they came out of my very particular wish, mm. showing a difference and going to the core of what you rightly said was in a very significant period, nuclear armament, mm. etc. So this is why I always learn from Ulisik 
how to negotiate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, he's, he's, he's a diplomat, no? So, yeah. <laughs> but he's tough, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You so, have to be to work with uh, yeah, North Koreans. Yeah, may, 